Okay. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's engineering webinar presented by Price Industries and covering healthcare and laboratory valve and control solutions. Our presenter today is Nolan Hosking. He's a senior product manager at Price, Industry and also Price Industries and also a professional engineer um, who oversees our critical environment solutions here at Price. Nolan has extensive experience in healthcare and laboratory application engineering and design and oversees the development of all associated air distribution, ceiling systems, control valves, and EDC control solutions. He's also a voting member of ASHRAE Standard 170 Committee, which is responsible for the North American standard governing the ventilation of healthcare facilities. I'm going to go ahead and pass the presentation over to Nolan. Thank you, Angeline. Uh, so today for the, uh, the presentation, we're going to do a very short introduction. Then we'll move into uh, valve considerations, and so we'll, we'll take a look at, uh, at different types of valves that can be used in labs and, uh, and some kind of comparing and contrasting uh, of the different types and advantages and disadvantages. And then we'll move into applications, and so we'll start with healthcare applications and, and look at how these various control solutions and valve solutions can be applied to uh, hospitals in particular, and isolation rooms and operating rooms. Uh, and then we'll look at, we'll kind of finish off with laboratory applications. And so we'll see how controls for fume hoods and, uh, and lab spaces in terms of offset controllers can be applied. Uh, and then there'll be a very short summary at the end. So just as, a, as an introduction, just to give you an idea of where price is as far as, uh, and, and you know, why we, um, uh, our experience and, uh, and sort of where our expertise comes from, we have over 10,000 Venturi valves that have been installed in the past 10 years. So 10,000 price manufactured Venturi valves uh, installed globally. And, uh, and that's fairly significant and so we have a fairly good idea of how these, these valves work and, and things you need to consider for the applications uh, and things you need to watch out for and that sort of thing. Also price is, in this market, is the and I feel confident saying this is the most vertically integrated company as far as uh, these products. So in terms of manufacturing of the valves, in terms of manufacturing of the controls, uh, everything is done in-house. We, we are not, not outsourcing uh, virtually any of the components, whether it be water coils or whether it be circuit boards. Uh, and so that gives us a lot of control over quality uh, as well as over lead time on these products. Plus we've got a lot of experience in terms of startup and commissioning and uh, essentially troubleshooting uh, of labs. And so that, uh, that really helps us with our, our product development and, uh, and essentially just our approach to this market. So first moving into valve considerations, uh, I'll start with Venturi valves and just kind of touch on the benefits that a Venturi valve offers. Really one of the, the key things is that it's a mechanically pressure independent valve uh, and which means that this valve is going to automatically adjust to changes in pressure uh, as they may happen in a, uh, in a duct system. So a manifolded uh, fume hood exhaust system would be a good example of that. And I'll touch more on these uh, or in a little bit more detail on these on, on slides later on. But also uh, just uh, really kind of summarizing these, uh, factory characterization, that would be uh, something. So instead of using an airflow sensor to, uh, to measure airflow through a conventional valve or conventional VAV box, I should say, we characterize the valve in the factory for flow versus valve position. And so I'll touch more on that uh, in a second. Uh, high turndown ratios, that's something that's very important with these valves. Uh, in particular on applications like fume hood applications, there have been some code changes that, that actually require or make it that a higher turndown ratio is more beneficial in certain applications, in particular with labs. And so we'll take a closer look at that. And then finally, these valves, unlike conventional VAB boxes, are fairly insensitive to inlet and outlet conditions in terms of having elbows or having uh, any kind of sort of strange uh, duct arrangements on those connections. We don't need straight duct runs running into and out of the valve. And so that's a big advantage, uh, especially because the applications that we would typically use these in are often fairly uh, congested applications in terms of the amount of space for this equipment. So if we look at, to really understand how the, what those benefits mean, it's, it's useful to look at uh, conventional VAB boxes to, uh, uh, to make a comparison. 
So if we look at a conventional VAV box in terms of its pressure independence, we can, uh, we can use this table right here. And so what this is showing essentially is that uh, a blade damper uh, that's providing pressure independence via a controller uh, is not going to be as fast as a mechanical adjustment of a Venturi valve. So we have with a conventional VAB box, we've got a cross flow sensor taking in a velocity pressure signal. That's going to go to a transducer, which is going to convert it, send that information to a controller. The controller is gonna, then going to send a signal to an actuator to adjust. Uh, and that loop is going to continue until the, uh, until the flow is achieved, uh, providing our, uh, essentially providing our pressure independence with a valve or a setup like that. If we compare that now to a Venturi valve, with a Venturi valve we have a, a Venturi shaped outer body and then we have a cone with an engineered spring inside that cone. And what happens is as the pressure across that valve or across that cone changes, it allows that that cone is able to move independently of the shaft that it is on, that is attached to, that, uh, that allows it to either provide less space or more space for air to pass depending on what the pressure is. So if we look at the, the valve cutaway on the, the left side here, at uh, one inch pressure across the valve, the cone would be in a certain position which would allow a certain amount of area for the air to pass. If the pressure goes up to three inches, that cone gets pushed further into the valve simply by that pressure, no, uh, no need for a controller, and there is now less area for the air to pass by that cone between the, the narrow channel of the Venturi body. And so with a, a calibrated and, and properly engineered Venturi valve, that's going to allow us to maintain uh, a, a constant flow across that valve with no external signal required to change any, any type of valve position. It's completely mechanical. Uh, something else that needs to be taken into account would be uh, issues with buildup on cross flow sensors. So with, with a cross flow sensor, we, uh, we're taking a velocity pressure signal and we're sending that essentially being read by a transducer and, and sending information to a controller. Uh, and so this is a, a necessary evil with, uh, with these types of valves. But one challenge is in return or certain uh, exhaust applications where we have in, within that application we've got a, a high concentration of, of airborne lint. So some good examples would be isolation rooms and operating rooms where there are, uh, there are a lot of linen changes every day. Then we typically have a, a significant presence, presence of this airborne lint and we can get build up quite easily. Uh, on valves as a result, which could potentially interfere with the, uh, the signal from the Venturi valve. So a Venturi valve is, is different in that it does not use the, or use an airflow sensor to control the flow. So instead, how the valve works is it's factory characterized, and what we're, essentially what we're doing is we're, we've got a potentiometer attached to every valve that is measuring the position of the control arm, which is able to move this control arm, is able to adjust the position of the center shaft where we have the cone, the engineered cone and spring assembly that's able to move on that shaft. And so uh, instead of using an airflow sensor to control the flow, which we have to do for a conventional VAV box because we don't have mechanical pressure independence, on a valve that does offer mechanical pressure independence, we can relate the position of this control arm to flow through the valve, and this would be an example. So we've got a 2 to 10 volt output from this potentiometer, and we can relate that directly to flow because we don't have to be concerned with what the pressure, what the exact pressure is across that valve, provided we're maintaining a certain minimum uh, across that valve. And so this is a very, uh, very advantageous thing in terms of how a Venturi valve works and that it allows us to control flow without a flow sensor. If we look at turndown and we first look at conventional VAV boxes, one challenge with VAV boxes is that a typical blade damper, as soon as that blade damper cracks, we're looking at about 30%, you know, approximately 25 to 30% flow through that valve as soon as that, uh, as soon as that damper uh, is even slightly open. And so that severely limits our potential as far as turndown is concerned. Another challenge as, with regard to turndown would be error with the transducer. And so if we look at, the, at this chart, we've got 
CFM, we've got velocity, we've got actual velocity pressure, then we have transducer error, and this is a, this is a very key uh, column here. We've got our measured velocity pressure, our measured velocity, and our, our measured CFM. And as you can see, at 1,000 CFM for this 10-inch BAB box, we've got a fairly accurate reading, less than 1% error based on this transducer error. At, when we get to a 5 to 1 turndown, which would be 200 CFM, we're up to 14% error, which is still, uh, is still somewhat reasonable, is not, uh, not ideal. But when we get down to a 10 to 1, or I should say up to a 10 to 1 turndown, and down to 100 CFM flow, then we're at 48% error. So it's clearly we're no longer uh, controlling uh, with a, a turndown of 10 to 1 with this particular example. Now, if we compare that to venturi valves, as far as turndown is concerned, uh, we have got significantly higher turndowns with the uh, with the venturi valves, and these would these are within a plus or minus five percent accuracy, and so that would be the uh, the general industry accepted uh, accuracy of a venturi valve uh, when tested with proper equipment. One thing to note on this uh, on this slide is that we've got two different pressure ranges for venturi valves. We've got medium pressure and we've got low pressure. And you can see that the low pressure has a range from 0.3 to 3 inches, while the medium pressure is 0.6 to 3 inches. And one might, without looking at anything else on this chart, one might say, well, you know, why do medium pressure valves even exist? They, uh, they have the, the same high end in terms of operating pressure, but they've got a worse, uh, a worse low end. Uh, and the reason is related to turn down and, and range of the, of the valve in terms of flow. And so the, uh, if you look at the, the low pressure valves, they have, a, they have a lower capacity and their turn down is not as high as we see for the, uh, for the medium pressure valves. And so that would be uh, the reason. When you need, uh, should your application require a turn down, uh, a very high turn down, then there's a chance that the medium pressure valve is going to be more appropriate than the low. So just to put the, the importance of of turn down into uh, kind of into your mind and, and make it a little bit more clear because you know some people on this webinar might be asking well you know who cares if I get a 20 to 1 turn down like when would I ever need a, a 20 to 1 turn down and so we'll use a little bit of an example here to kind of help explain that uh, first before we kind of get into the example though looking at a, a code change that that really makes turn down a little bit more applicable and a little bit more important when it comes to controlling fume hood exhaust. And so if we look at ANSI Z9.5, the, uh, the 2003 version, and we'll compare that to uh, a related section from ANSI uh, Z9.5, the 2012 version, in uh, what this section is essentially stating is it's going through the, the minimum exhaust requirements uh, from, a fume, uh, from a fume hood. And uh, really the, the key here is this line that's fourth from the bottom. Uh, 50 CFM per foot of hood width or 25 CFM per square foot of hood work surface area. And this 25 CFM per square foot of hood work surface area is essentially uh, about the same value because a lot of the hoods are about two feet deep. Uh, and so this is the main number we're working with here, 50 CFM per foot, which would mean, for example, on a six foot hood that our minimum exhaust, uh, exhaust rate from that hood would be 300 CFM. If we compare that to the, uh, the 2012 version of this standard, it's a little bit less black and white now, but they talk about air changes, hood air changes, and that 150 to 375 hood air changes has been used successfully to control uh, concentrations inside the hood or essentially containment. And so if we take a look at what that actually means, in comparison, the, the 50 CFM per foot of hood width and 150 hood air changes per hour, this is essentially equivalent to about 10 CFM per linear foot. So we're going from 50 CFM per linear foot down to approximately 10 CFM per linear foot. So a, a very significant change there. So taking a look at how that would apply to an actual application, if we continue with the, the six foot hood example, this, this chart would essentially show uh, what turndown would be required based on the, the 2003 ANSI code to maintain um, 
essentially to control and operate this fume hood uh, within its uh, within its range. And so, if we look at our, our maximum value for this uh, for this hood based on an 18-inch sash opening, we're at 900 cfm. And then, if we look at our minimum based on the ANSI Z9.5 2003 code, we're at 300 cfm. So we're actually only using a, a three-to-one turndown here. So the the Venturi valve, while it does offer a number of uh, of other advantages that uh, that are important to lab, the turndown in this case doesn't look like it would be one of those. However, if we now look at the ANSI Z9.5, the 2012 version, we uh, and we look at the required turndown based on 10 cfm per foot. Now we're down to 60 CFM exhaust flow rate from this hood, and so we're using almost the entire, uh, with the exception of the safety factor near the uh, near the top end of this of this valve. We're looking at basically the entire turndown for this Venturi valve in order to achieve our minimum flow from that hood. And so, with this code change, the turndown, uh, as far as fume hood turndown is concerned, and fume hood applications are concerned is a lot more important. So kind of moving away from valves now, taking a look more at applications and at uh, things that are specifically related to these applications, we'll start with healthcare. And so with healthcare, what, we're, what we want to get at here, what we really want to speak to is room pressurization as far as, uh, as far as these healthcare spaces. Our goal is to have air moving from clean spaces into less clean spaces, and so we want to I either have positively pressurized rooms if we're trying to protect the patient, or we want to have negatively pressurized rooms if we're trying to pr protect other people in the healthcare facility. What we require to create this uh, differential pressure is essentially we need an offset between the supply rate and the exhaust rate, and so we've got different strategies we can use to accomplish that. And we also need a, a tightly sealed room. The more tightly sealed the, the room envelope is, the easier it is to achieve a, a differential pressure between uh, that room and adjoining spaces. So the different applications uh, that would come into play most often, or, or usually when we're talking about these uh, healthcare applications, the one that the ones that we're primarily considering would be isolation rooms and operating rooms. And so there are a number of different isolation rooms that we're not going to get into too much detail between the differences, but uh, in for all types, there would be uh, certain configurations and certain sequences for the controls that would be uh, applied to each to kind of achieve the, um, the desired result. So when we're maintaining room pressure, in, uh, regardless of the application, in a lot of cases it is nice to have some type of room pressure monitor to, uh, so we don't only have room pressure in the space, but we have a way of actually visually checking or indicating that room pressure is being maintained and, and you know, a sufficient room pressure uh, is, all, is being maintained uh, and directional airflow is, is the way we want it. Uh, another thing that's uh, fairly important is that having the room pressure monitor gets us away from needing to do daily smoke tests that are required by uh, a number of different standards actually when uh, and codes when room pressure monitors aren't available for isolation rooms in particular. Uh, and so having a way of avoiding the, uh, essentially avoiding the work and avoiding the, the cost of, of doing this, uh, sorry, doing these daily smoke tests is a big deal. Second, it leads us into, you know, how cost effective are these monitors because, of course, there's going to be a cost associated with putting the monitor in as well. And so if we look at healthcare facilities and kind of a trend in terms of construction, we are, we are seeing more isolation rooms being uh, put into these spaces, whether it's to uh, uh, whether it's just based on current demand or whether it's based on being prepared for certain situations, certain situations and certain kind of pandemic situations. Uh, there's it's a bit of both, but uh, really knowing that there are more isolation rooms going to most facilities now is something that's very key. And if we consider, like was presented on the last slide, the alternative to having a room pressure monitor is doing smoke tests, we're looking at about 15 minutes per day uh, or per smoke test per room. Uh, and in some cases, depending on what code is being, uh, is the primary code being followed, you might be looking at two of these tests uh, per day per room. And so it becomes quite expensive in terms of 
of maintaining uh, and following this procedure uh, when isolation room monitors aren't available. So if we look at a couple codes and, and what they require, if we look at ASHRAE 170, there's actually a requirement that isolation rooms have some type of permanently installed device to essentially indicate directional airflow. There's also a requirement that is uh, just subsequent to the, uh, to the first one requiring that there is some type of way of avoiding nuisance alarms because one of the, one of the challenges with uh, some of these uh, earlier uh, sort of display type, digital display type monitors or uh, mo monitors with some type of audible alarm is that there would be constant nuisance type alarms when doors were open or things were being cleaned and, uh, and those, there needs to be some kind of allowances put in place with these monitors that allow us to prevent those issues. If we look at OSHA, there are, uh, there's a requirement that essentially a lot of rooms where, uh, where we've got certain types of patients that, uh, that may be considered sort of airborne infectious isolation room type patients, uh, there's a requirement that the pressure is essentially checked uh, on a daily basis. And OSHA actually has a requirement that when monitors aren't available for those spaces that two smoke tests daily are required. And once again, something that uh, it wouldn't take long to, to justify and to have a payback for a permanent isolation room monitor uh, when we're looking at the alternative. So if we look at, we look at monitor types, there are uh, you know, two different types, a ball and tube indicator, or you know, some people refer to it as a, as a ping pong ball monitor, and then a, a digital display where we've got some type of uh, readout on the display itself. And so if we're taking a, a closer look at these, the, the ball and tube indicator, the attraction to this type of monitor is really kind of two primary ones. One is that it's a, a fairly low cost solution as far as monitors are concerned. Uh, it does give you a, a very clear, visible indication of what's going on with the room pressure in that space. And so it's convenient for nurses. They can be, you know, they can be quite a ways down a corridor and still have a, a clear indication that pressure in that space is being maintained and that, that is something that is, uh, is convenient and, and therefore attractive to uh, healthcare facility workers working in a ward like that. It does indicate directional airflow only, so you, uh, you're not going to, there's no indication of whether you're, you know, 0 0.015 inches pressure or 0 0.02. Uh, in a lot of cases, that type of detailed information is, is not required, uh, in particular at the, uh, at the healthcare, the local healthcare worker level, but, uh, but it is something that uh, does limit the, uh, essentially the usefulness of a sensor like this. Plus, the, the appearance is a little bit antiquated, it, um, but given that it is a lower cost solution and uh, what a uh, solution that provides a very easy visual means of identifying the room pressure, uh, it's still something that gets installed quite frequently into these applications. If we look at uh, the digital display type monitor, these would give you uh, both a visual and audible indication of what's going on with the, uh, what's going on with the pressure in the room. They can be reconfigured in terms of having different set points for alarms, and different user preferences, different displays uh, for potentially having uh, less information uh, put on the screen uh, to, to avoid questions being asked that, that um, really would just, you know, be considered a bit of a nuisance in themselves. Uh, and also we can tie into a building management system in a lot of cases with uh, a monitor like this, which uh, allows for trending uh, as well as uh, adjustment from the, uh, from the front end if um, if it was required. So kind of moving on from, uh, from the monitor itself to the sensor, because we have to have uh, some type of room pressure sensor to, uh, to tie in with the monitor essentially to allow us to uh, display anything. And so there's a, a few different types of sensors that I, we should discuss essentially. So there's an understanding of, of what the, the benefits and the drawbacks are to each. And so first, if we look at a diaphragm sensor, this is a, or sometimes called a dead end sensor. This is a, these types of sensor, sensors offer some advantages. One thing, in terms of how these sensors operate, fairly straightforward, they're called a dead end sensor or a diaphragm sensor because they're, in part, because there is no air transfer between two spaces. And so when we're measuring the differential between two spaces, 
There is no air passing between the two uh, spaces through this sensor. Instead, the pressure on one side of the on one side of the sensor is going to push on a flexible membrane that is essentially going to push on the pressure sensor, and that's going to give us uh, that's going to give us a reading as to what the differential pressure is between the two spaces, and then that will be uh, used essentially by the monitor. If we look at a hot wire anemometer type sensor, this would be where we've got essentially a hot wire or a probe in the airstream, and uh, and this would be kind of a configuration that would be fairly typical of these applications where we've got uh, an ambient air temperature sensor uh, over here, and then we've got a velocity sensor, which is essentially a heater. And what we're measuring in the case of uh, in the case of this configuration is we're measuring the voltage required to maintain a difference in temperature between the the ambient air temperature and the the heater here. And that voltage can there can then be converted essentially into uh, a velocity, which can be converted into a flow through the uh, through the orifice or through the tube, uh, which gives us allows us to calculate differential uh, room pressure between two spaces. And so those would be kind of uh, two of the, the more typical approaches to uh, room pressure sensors for these applications. If we take a closer look at advantages and disadvantages of, of a diaphragm sensor, uh, big advantages is that because we don't have air passing actually through this sensor, we don't have potential for the sensor to get contaminated because there is no flow through the sensor, and so we're not dragging uh, particles or fumes or whatever it might be through the sensor. So that is attractive. Uh, in terms of disadvantages, there is these sensors do drift. They're, they do require calibration on a, on a somewhat regular basis to ensure that they're working accurately, uh, and so that definitely has to be considered and uh, taken into account as far as maintenance and, uh, and procedures. Uh, in a facility utilizing these types of sensors. Also, they're, they're typically less accurate than the, the hot wire or the, the thermal anemometer type sensors uh, that we're going to take a look at next. And so if we look at a, a hot wire anemometer type sensor, advantages is you can just almost flip with the, uh, the advantages and disadvantages from the last slide. Uh, and so we've got better accuracy. These are not going to drift, so they're not requiring recalibration with the, uh, this type of sensor. Disadvantages, however, was we do have air transferring between spaces. The air is moving, provided the room is pressurized correctly, the air is moving from the clean space to the less clean space. Uh, and so the, the transfer of, of some air is, is not necessarily a big deal in that regard. But when air is transferring and moving through the sensor, then there is a lot more potential for sensor contamination uh, because there is the potential for lint uh, or other airborne particulate to, as it's passing over that probe, taking a measurement in the airstream, for it to collect on that probe and, and build up and, and cause interference with that signal. So another sensor type that can be used, this is uh, somewhat, probably the closest to the, uh, to the hot wire anemometer example, but would be a thermal MEMS, so micro, microelectronic mechanical system would be MEMS. A differential pressure sensor. And so this type of sensor offers a, a lot of advantages if we take a look at the way it works. And so instead of having uh, essentially a, a hot wire or a probe in the airstream to take some type of velocity measurement of air passing through it, now what we have is we've got a, a silicone plate with a heater embedded into it. And then we've got a grid or essentially an array of sensors around that heater. And Air is flowing through this sensor, so it is a flow through style sensor. But as that air flows over the heater and the array of sensors, it's going to distribute the, essentially distribute that heat across that sensor array in a certain way. And based on that distribution of heat across the sensor array, we can make a calculation as to what the flow is through this sensor. Uh, and we can uh, use that information to determine what the differential pressure is between the two spaces. And so this type of sensor offers uh, a lot of advantage, a lot of advantages without the, uh, the risks that, uh, that the conventional hot wire anemometer might present. Now taking a look at control, so that was, that was all looking at monitoring, but if we want to look at control now, which is uh, important, there are, are three different methods essentially of 
controlling flow or not flow, but uh, well, not just flow, but pressure uh, into these spaces. And so one would be a direct pressure control, which in that case, what we're doing is we're controlling the exhaust independent of the supply. And so we would be controlling directly to pressure and we would be modulating an exhaust damper essentially to maintain pressure in a space. And so the, the supply would be constant or at least independent of that exhaust and the exhaust damper would be modulated based on a controller signal to maintain a certain pressure. The second example, CFM tracking control, this is pretty straightforward. This would essentially be a tracking pair, so a tracking uh, supply and exhaust valve where the exhaust valve will track whatever the supply valve is doing in order to maintain a certain offset in the space uh, and in turn uh, a certain differential pressure between uh, two spaces. Now dynamic offset control is kind of a combination of the first two or you could call it uh, smart CFM tracking would be another way of putting it. And that's where we are doing CFM tracking so we're maintaining a, a certain offset between the supply and the exhaust using a controller but that controller is also taking into account what the room pressure is based on that CFM offset and will automatically adjust that offset based on whether or not the pressure is being maintained in the space. And so those, those are kind of the three uh, most typical methods of controlling, uh, controlling pressure in a given application, primarily isolation rooms and operating rooms. Now if we look at the, the valves, we've, you know, we've talked a little bit more about the Venturi valves in the first section, but if we look at the valve configuration that makes the most sense for healthcare applications, in general, and, and this would be for the critical healthcare applications like isolation rooms and operating rooms, in general using a standard terminal unit or, or VAV box on the supply side and using a Venturi valve on the return of the exhaust side makes the most sense. For the, the VAV box and the supply, it makes the most sense because the, the pressure in the system is stable and so you're not looking for the, or you don't have the same requirement for mechanical pressure independence that you would in a, say, a manifolded fume hood exhaust system where you've got major pressure fluctuations based on sashes being adjusted. The, uh, the operating pressure of a VAV box is quite a bit lower than a venturi valve, so you've got lower cost on the operating pressure, you've got lower upfront cost for the valve itself, and you've got lower sound. And so there's, there are a lot of reasons why a standard VAV box in the supply makes sense. On the return side, the venturi valve makes a lot of sense because you can avoid the potential buildup on the cross flow sensor or the airflow sensor in that return or exhaust valve that would potentially interfere with the signal you were taking in and, uh, and the flow through that valve. And this is, uh, this is very important because if we start losing that signal on the return of the exhaust side and we're using a tracking approach, a CFM tracking approach, where we're essentially just measuring the, fl the flow into the room and the flow out of the room, we have the potential to actually uh, lose pressure in the space and go from, say, a, a positive pressure space to a negative pressure space uh, because we don't have an accurate reading of what's going through that return or exhaust valve. So that leads us into laboratory applications and so we'll take a uh, look at this application relative to uh, what we just did for healthcare. So we look at a general commercial building uh, and so we're not looking at a lab here but just a general commercial building. We've got a certain supply CFM and a certain return CFM and there's going to be some exhausted air and there's going to be some makeup air to, uh, to offset that, uh, that exhaust air. And so uh, fairly, uh, fairly typical of, of a commercial office space or other commercial buildings. If we compare that to a laboratory building, it's significantly different. And this really speaks to the need or the, the justification for using VAB controls in laboratory spaces. So we bring in a certain, uh, certain supply, say 100,000 CFM supply into this lab and we're exhausting all of that. And so all of the conditioning that went into that air is being pumped out of the fume hoods and out of the general exhaust. And so a very expensive system to run. And so any opportunity we have to apply VAV controls to and different valves to allow us to optimize the system and, and reduce the amount of air that we're pumping into the atmosphere, 
the uh, the better off we're going to be, which is the, the justification for using this type of equipment uh, in laboratories. So while the reasoning behind using a VAV control solution in, in labs would be to essentially in large part to, to reduce energy costs and to, to save energy, there are some things that in terms of importance that we can't forget about. We can't sacrifice these in, uh, uh, for the sake of reducing energy consumption. And so the first one would be fume hood containment. That is, uh, that is far and away the, the most critical thing in the, uh, as far as the lab applications are concerned when it comes to the HVAC system. We need to make sure that we're not losing fumes and losing containment out of the hood. Next would be room pressure. In, Almost all cases, we want to be maintaining a negative room pressure uh, and ensuring that air is moving into the lab as opposed to uh, leaking out of the lab. So directional airflow is very important. And finally, maintaining our ventilation requirements. And the ventilation requirements will vary depending on what code we're following or what, uh, what method we're, we're following in terms of, uh, in terms of establishing a uh, minimum ventilation requirement. Uh, and so that will be the, the third uh, critical thing on this um, as far as considerations for labs. So these are what make labs more challenging. Fume hoods are the, the big difference between healthcare applications and lab applications, which essentially cause the, the big challenge as far as the, uh, the control system and the valves for these applications. And so if we First, consider fume hood containment. One of the things that's important to remember, and this seems very basic, but it, uh, uh, it's amazing how often this is not taken into account, is has to do with sash stops on fume hoods. And so the fume hood is, is going to be designed, A, to work to a certain maximum sash height, and also the, the valve is going to be sized, in most cases, based on that maximum sash height. And so in this, uh, in this image, we show a hood and the, the hood is open to its maximum sash height, maximum, uh, uh, sorry, maximum sash height of 18 inches. This is giving us 100 feet per minute face, face velocity, so that's velocity into the hood. Uh, and as you can see in these images, we're maintaining our containment, and the, the fumes are moving into the hood uh, and all as well. But if we open the sash up to 28 inches, so beyond the maximum height for that hood, uh, and also beyond where the valve is able to open enough to maintain uh, enough exhaust flow rate from that hood and maintain that 100 feet per minute face velocity, now we're losing containment. So we've gone down to 65 feet per minute face velocity. And you can see most clearly in the image on the right that we have lost containment on that hood. And so that is, a, uh, of course, a, a dangerous situation. Different ways of controlling the, the volume or the exhaust from, uh, from a hood and essentially controlling the face velocity uh, into one of these fume hoods. The most common method would be sash position sensing. And so this is pretty straightforward. This is where we've got uh, a sash, whether it be horizontal or horizontal and vertical or just vertical. And what we're doing is we're essentially using t some type of sensor to measure the position of that uh, measure the open area of that fume hood. Uh, and so what we're doing is we're using some type of, some type of sensor, where usually uh, some type of rotary potentiometer attached to uh, a cable, and we're going to measure how much that, uh, that sash opens, and then we're going to do the math if we want 100 feet per minute, which is going to be typical of most hoods. Uh, and we, for example, we open the hood up, say a five-foot hood, we open it up uh, two feet then that gives us a 10 square foot opening. So 1,000 CFM would be what we would require to exhaust from there. So it's a calculated value. And when used in conjunction with a Venturi valve, which is a position-based valve, we can get a, a very fast response rate uh, from that configuration of using sash position sensing and Venturi valves, essentially so that the valve goes exactly to where it's required based on this calculation. So fairly effective. In a lot of cases, there, it will vary from, uh, from one installation to the next. But in a lot of cases, the sash position sensor, in terms of where it gets installed, uh, keep in mind it is a, a rotary potentiometer with a, essentially a stainless steel cable attached to it. It would often be attached to the, 
the cable for the counterweight. So this would be a, the cable for the, the counterweight attached to the, the sash, essentially ensuring that the sash doesn't just close after it's been opened. Uh, and by attaching the sash sensor to that cable, it kind of keeps it out of the way uh, in most cases and is, uh, is quite accessible uh, as well. And so we'll often see the, the sash position sensor attached to that cable. Uh, another approach that is, uh, that is very different from sash position sensing in terms of maintaining face velocity would be called face velocity measurement or sidewall sensing. And so how this works is we've got, essentially we've got a port on the outside of the hood. This would be the sash door here. And then we've got a port inside the hood. And we're me measuring the differential pressure uh, from the outside of the hood to the inside of the hood using these, uh, using these two ports. And when we know the differential pressure, then we know uh, what the flow into any opening in that hood would be, and we know what the velocity would be. So it is it's actual measurement of what we're trying to control with these uh, with these valves and with these controls. So if we compare the two, we compare sash position sensing, which is measuring the position or the open area once the sash is moved, and we compare that to sidewall sensing. First, looking at sash position sensing, the the big advantage and it's a, it is very impressive is the, the speed of sash position sensing. Because you're calculating the value, you're calculating the open area of the sash based on the, the sash door moving, it, uh, it's very quick to make that calculation. And the valve, because, it's a, because Venturi valves are position-based valves, they can just go exactly to where they need to go based on that calculation. So it's incredibly fast. Generally, after you finish moving the sash, you'll find that the valve is is almost stopped moving or it stops moving a split second later. The challenge with doing sash position only is that the, the system and the controls won't compensate for any obstructions in that hood. And so if there's a person standing in front of the hood or there's, there's equipment stacked in the hood, there's an autoclave in the hood, and, and a big part of that area that the controller thinks is now open because the sash was moved is not in fact open, and so say that 10 square foot opening that we had in that uh, a couple slides ago in that calculation example, let's say that, that five square feet of that is blocked between the person and the equipment stacked in the hood. You're still going to have your 1,000 CFM going into that hood, but now you've only got five square feet instead of 10 square feet, and so your face velocity is going to be closer to 200 feet per minute instead of the desired 100. And well, while that may seem like a good thing, well, 200 feet per minute is twice as good as, as 100 feet per minute, no? The, uh, that, is, that is definitely not the case, and hoods are designed to work within a certain range of face velocity around 100 feet per minute, and once we get well in excess of that range, then we get issues with the face velocity being too high, air coming into the hood, and then essentially uh, being pulled right back out, and also pulling whatever is potentially in the hood out with it. And so we have major containment issues when our velocities are too high as well as when they're too low. Now sidewall sensing, the nice thing here is that it, it's extremely accurate. It is still fairly quick. It just would not be quite as fast in isolation as the, uh, the sash position sensing would be. But now we're essentially controlling to or we're measuring what we're trying to control. And so we're very accurate. So if we have the sash open to a certain position, and we start stacking up equipment and blocking part of that opening, then the airflow, the valve, and the controller are going to adjust to ensure that the, the phase velocity remains at 100 feet per minute. With, uh, given that velocities aren't uh, as stable as an, as, uh, as an opening as a sash position measurement would be, just a, a calculated value, there is going to be some overshoot and undershoot when you're using this method. Another method that is, uh, is a little bit less common but is, uh, is very useful and, uh, and makes a lot of sense would be a hybrid solution where you're doing sash position sensing and sidewall sensing. And so that would be when you're moving the sash, you're using sash position sensing. And when the sash is stationary, using sidewall sensing to make adjustments for any uh, obstructions. And so this is a this offers speed, speed accuracy and redundancy, so you've got two sensors, so if you lose one, uh, you're still online with that hood. 
So looking at uh, taking a look at room pressurization, I already mentioned that negative pressurization is what we're looking for. I, one of the key things on here is uh, to note is we're trying to avoid cross flow between modules. We'll touch on that with a couple slides. And volumetric tracking or CFM tracking in general is what we're going to be doing in, uh, in most cases with labs. Uh, and so we're ensuring that our, our total supply is going to be equal to our total exhaust minus whatever offset we figure out is required and works well for that lab space. So looking at flow tracking, constant volume flow tracking, pretty straightforward. We just ensure that uh, if we're using constant volume hoods, we just ensure that our exhaust rate is slightly higher than our supply rate. With VAV flow tracking, in this case, we are going to need to adjust our supply and our general exhaust based on what's going on with the hoods. So as the hoods are adjusting and flow is changing from the hoods, in conjunction we're changing our general exhaust and our supply to ensure that we have a constant offset between the, the supply and the exhaust and that provides us with our, our constant pressure in the space. Now if we look at, at modules or, or zones within a lab, I apologize for the, the text being so small here, but what we're looking at here would be uh, different modules. And so these would be four hoods all, all facing uh, facing in, and then we've got a, a supply into that module, and then here's another four hoods, and, and you, you beyond that, just don't even worry about it. But we've got one module here, and another module here, and essentially what we're looking at is, or what we're talking about when we're looking at modules, is we want to have labs within labs. So it's in a, in a larger lab setting, we want to create small labs to ensure that we're not getting cross flow between modules. And so in this case, all the hoods are open, and we've got a certain supply uh, into, uh, into the space, and so the supply is the same here as it is here, and all the hoods are exhausting 1650 CFM. If we close all the hoods on the right side, this is what we want to happen. Nothing has happened at all to the supply, and, the, and of course to the hoods, because nothing has changed with the sash position over here, but these hoods have all gone down to 450 CFM, and this supply has reduced to compensate entirely for the reduction in exhaust from this module. So what we wouldn't want to see is all these hoods close, closing and this supply and this supply going down by, by whatever the, the total supply amount would be to, uh, to maintain our overall offset within the space. We want to ensure that the supply feeding the module with these hoods is the only one that adjusts. Otherwise, what we would have is we would have an oversupply into this area and an undersupply into this area, and we'd have air moving from this module and crossing over into this module. And that cross flow creates for unpredictable uh, sort of dynamics within the room as far as the airflow goes. Taking a quick look at, at networking, uh, one thing that we want to do with uh, when we're networking is Although we're trying to, in almost all cases, tie into some building management system, we have to be very careful with the lab because of the speed required and the response rate required between components. And so we've got uh, exhaust valves and controllers on these hoods. We've got a general exhaust valve here. We've got a supply valve here. And we've got a, kind of a central controller here that everything is tying back into. Everything within this space is going to need to operate on some type of room level network that allows for this high speed response between components because when the when the fume hood exhaust valve valves move, there can't be that signal can't go to the front end and then communication come back to the, the supply valve to let it know that it needs to change. That would not be that would not provide for a fast enough response rate and we would have issues with pressurization uh, in the lab. And that's the, the reason why we've got uh, a room level network in the space. Something to consider with these, uh, these room level networks and how we're tying to the, uh, to the BMS, the building management system, is that as far as if we're looking at the protocol and the, uh, essentially the, the native protocol for the controllers that are, be used, that are being used in that room level network, it is a, a consideration that you want to take into account is what is the native protocol of those controllers and is it the same as the, the front end protocol of the BMS system. And in cases where it's not, then gateways need to be used to essentially convert one protocol over to the other. And, 
And the challenge or the, the drawback with gateways is that, first of all, the, the most tangible thing or, or one of the most tangible is just the, the flat out cost of a gateway. Uh, they're expensive and they add a lot of cost to the system, but also your flexibility and your accessibility of information at room level becomes a lot less and it becomes more challenging essentially and less flexible for the most part to uh, to work with that lab through your front end which is operating on a different protocol. So something to, uh, to take into account. So just a quick summary. As far as uh, price is concerned or price the, the company I mean, price critical controls, we do have a, a website and so as far as the products we offer you can get a lot of information uh, in terms of brochures and submittals and, and that sort of information on this website and so it's pricecriticalcontrols.com and in terms of our facilities if, uh, if you have any interest in coming to our facilities to uh, either to have mock-ups performed or to see some demonstrations of some of these products or, uh, or related products then uh, I encourage you to talk to your local price representative and make an arrangement to, uh, to come and uh, have some of this work done or, or see uh, a new application or or a new mock-up that you would be uh, curious in having done. Great. Thank you very much, Nolan. Uh, we've received quite a large number of questions already, and we're going to do our best to address all of those. Um, if you do have a question that you've been sitting on, please go ahead and submit it to us now using the question function on your GoToWebinar toolbar. Um, Nolan, to get us started, we had a couple of people ask us, what is the lowest pressure that you can uh, use and still have accurate readings? I assume that question is related to Venturi valves and, uh, and so a low pressure, the low pressure style of Venturi valve would go down to 0.3 inches water column across the valve and so that would be that would be a low pressure and that's the lowest you could go there is the 0.3. Typically you know, because that's the minimum the system is going to be operated slightly above that to ensure that, uh, that we do have the accuracy. Uh, with a medium pressure valve, the minimum is 0.6 inches water column, and so that would be that would be the, the different minimums for the two valves. Okay, thank you. Um, are there spring consistency issues when mounting the Venturi's vertically versus horizontally? There, not so much spring consistency issues. There would be, there would definitely be spring issues if you mounted a, a horizontal Venturi valve in the vertical position. So. With um, a vertical valve uses a different type of spring or a, essentially a, a spring that is, that is calibrated differently than a horizontal valve will. And so there won't be consistency issues as far as that spring is concerned, but it's important that the right valve is ordered for the, the right orientation that's going to be or the orientation that it's going to be installed in. Okay, thank you. Can a Venturi valve be installed on the same air handling unit as a V8? as a v, standard VAV box? Uh, it can, it, uh, but it, in terms of whether it should be or not would depend on the application and it would depend on the configuration of the ductwork that was, uh, uh, that was set up in that particular instance. In, in healthcare applications, that, uh, it is, it's a lot more realistic and, and it, it's going to be possible in a lot more cases. With lab applications, you've got to be a lot more careful, and, and generally, we would recommend against doing that for lab applications. But we've uh, we've done it very successfully in uh, in many healthcare applications. Uh, when looking at pressure sensors, what kind of cost difference do you typically see between the diaphragm, the hot water anemometer, and the uh, thermal MEMS differential pressure sensor? It's uh, usually the the dominating factor in the cost of the uh, of the room pressure monitor sensor combination is not going to be the sensor itself. It's going to be the, the interface uh, between the, the user uh, and that sensor. And so that uh, the cost difference between the sensors is, it definitely varies, but that's not going to be the driving force in the, the cost difference of the solution. And so it's, uh, for the most part, it's more important to, to ask what, um, what is the interface going to be uh, for that sensor? Okay, thank you. Um, wh what is the difference and the pros and cons of Venturi valves versus Phoenix valves that are optional on a lot of hoods? Well, the, 
the Phoenix valves are Venturi valves. It's just the Phoenix controls makes those valves, and and so a, a Phoenix valve is a Venturi valve. So they're they're essentially identical. Okay. Um, is the sidewall sensor measuring velocity or uh, differential pressure? The uh, the sidewall sensor it can vary depending on on whose sidewall sensor. As far as the the uh, the price sidewall sensor would be measuring velocity. Uh, it would be it would be using that uh, that same technology, the thermal MEMS technology, to measure velocity and convert that into a pressure signal. Okay, thank you. If you are using a pressure independent valve and a sidewall sensor trying to trim the flow, how do you keep the two loops from working against each other? The um, that's a good question. Well, it's not a good question in terms of <laughs> not being able to answer it. That's a, that's a, that's a que like in terms of uh, explaining that in a in a succinct way is um, the uh, the sidewall sensor. You're measuring a, a you're measuring a, a certain velocity using the sidewall sensor. So you've got a velocity measurement. You're going to have a dead band, and so you're not going to be controlling to 100 feet per minute to the uh, to the single digit, so you're going to have a, a dead band between, say, 95 and 105, or 90 and 110. Uh, and so, when you've got, uh, essentially, once once you fall outside of that, depending on what is going on in front of the hood, that would would change that velocity, uh, and you fall outside of that, then your uh, your pressure independent valve is just going to is going to make an adjustment to either slightly increase or slightly decrease the flow. Uh, and then you're going to be once again continually measuring that uh, that velocity. So there really is no there really is no uh, issue with the loops uh, fighting each other. Is there any required maintenance for the mechanical venturi valve spring or linkage, and how often would maintenance be required? No, there's no requirement for maintenance. The the springs are are life cycle tested to to millions and millions of cycles, uh, and that continues to happen well beyond what a properly installed venturi valve would ever experience uh, in a in a you know decades or a lifetime of use, uh, and so there there is uh, like in terms of his long term hysteresis or just hysteresis in general and longevity of the spring, uh, we don't uh, we don't see issues. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there options for occupancy sensors and fume hood sensors for unoccupied CFM values to the room controller? There are, yep. Yeah, we've got uh, some fairly, uh, fairly sophisticated options as far as different occupancy sensors and, and fume hood uh, occupancy sensors as well. When discussing the uh, sash, sash position sensing, you, you mentioned that. Uh, hang on. Um, Obstructions uh, can be a negative for sash position sensing, but according to most hood manufacturers' documentation, all obstruction should be more than six inches inside of the plane of the sash for the fume hood to work properly. So, if people are adhering to these guidelines, are obstructions really an issue? Uh, I mean, I guess that would be that would be something that, uh, depending on the hood, would um, might alleviate the issue. The the question is though in um, is that going on in practice? And so it's 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 one thing to say that well, if they if they had moved their equipment a few inches further back, then this wouldn't be an issue. But uh, the sidewall sensing makes it so even if they're not following that procedure, uh, they're still going to be maintaining the correct face velocity. Okay, thank you very much, Nolan. I think we pretty much addressed all of the qu the questions that we had today. And if we didn't, we will follow up with you after the webinar. Thank you so much for your presentation today, Nolan. Uh, we have another webinar upcoming in January looking at retrofit opportunities with active and passive beams. And then regarding your professional development hour for today, uh, we will be email sending you a short email in just a few minutes that will contain a link to a short quiz. If you could go ahead and complete that, we will begin processing your PDH credit. Thank you to everybody who joined us for today's event, and that concludes the webinar. Goodbye.